introduce Sam. Uh, he is uh, from Hanover. Uh, I, don't, I think he grew up in uh, California and uh, went to Harvard, undergraduate history, then on to Harvard uh, Medical School, and uh, he uh, then practiced for many years at the Dartmouth Medical School and is now head of a very, very important research center at Brigham and Win Win Women's uh, Hospital in, uh, in, um, in Boston. And he commutes from his home uh, in Aetna to uh, Boston several times a week. Um, he is also a bishop in the LDS Church. And uh, that is a very, very important position, as you all know. And he is head of the, uh, what they call the ward, the church in Lebanon that serves ha uh, Hanover and Lebanon. And I attended one of the services uh, recently at which uh, Sam presided. I've been in uh, the LDS Church before and in other, other communities. And it was an excellent uh, uh, service. Uh, there was a question uh, by one or two members of the audience about are uh, non-Mormons allowed into the service? Well, they welcome people to come to their service. Not, you don't have to stay for the entire three hours, but Sam can get to that. Sam has done some uh, very, very interesting research uh, in his uh, career on the differences in health delivery, particularly surgery, uh, in rural areas of America as opposed to urban areas. And if you want to get into that in the question period, we'll be happy to do that as well. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Sam Finlayson, who is going to talk uh, about his perspective inside of the LDS Church. Thank you for coming and joining us. So, uh, so you've, had, you've, had, you've probably had chances in you know, the community to interact with Mormons, but perhaps um, not always uh, convenient to ask questions of them, or, or you know, some of them even if pointed questions, if you like because um, I'm, I'm not afraid of any pointed questions either. Um, I'm happy to talk about anything you want to talk um, as it relates to my experiences in the church and my views of the church. Um, I'm not, I want to make very clear at the outset that I do not represent the church and I'm speaking to you, I represent myself as a member of the church. Um, I happen to have a respons some responsibility in the church, um, but everybody in our church has some responsibility. Um, this, that's part of the way the church works, and we'll get to that uh, later on. Um, but I wanted, what, I, what I thought I would do uh, is sort of paint a picture of what it was like uh, to, uh, to uh, be a member of the church uh, growing up uh, and, and through my life uh, so far to, to give you some perspective. So um, uh, Tom gave you a, uh, a, an introduction, uh, and he, and he tipped, his, tipped his hand a little bit to, to where I've come from. Um, but if you hadn't heard that, um, and you heard that I was a Mormon, what kind of assumptions might you have made? So, for example, where I was from? Utah. Utah, <laughs> right. So, you know, I have, most of my life has been spent uh, among people who are not Mormons. Uh, the vast majority of my acquaintances or friends are not Mormon. Um, and when I'm in the new situation, I'm getting to know people, you know, maybe a month later, I'll hear, and, and where my religion has not come up, uh, somebody will say, oh, make some reference to Utah as if I was from there. And from that point I know, ah, this person has found out somehow that I'm a Mormon, because that's one of the first assumptions. So, <clears throat> question number one, what state has the most Mormons in it? California, right. So, I'm from California, so that shouldn't be too surprising. If you're gonna, if you're gonna play the odds, as to you know where I'm, where the Mormon is from, guess California first and Utah second, because there are more Mormons in Utah. Okay, now that and that's it. now you, maybe that makes me a little bit more typical Mormon being from California, but actually not. The typical Mormon uh, is named Jose or Marco and lives in Chile, and was born uh, into a Mormon family. Uh, there are more Mormons outside of the United States than there are within the United States. Um, and particularly in Latin America, uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, members of our church. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so some of the stereotypes that, that people have of Mormons are, quite frankly, not too correct. They may, be, they may fit to some extent uh, just from probability being in the United States, but actually, if you wanted to take the typical Mormon, it wouldn't look, it wouldn't look that much like me. Where I grew up, um, 
distinctions were very few, um, even ethnic distinctions. Um, well, I was really surprised when I moved to Boston and people actually knew who the Irish were. I had no idea who the Irish were. <laughs> you know, Lori McCloskey, no idea that she was Irish. Or, or my friend uh, Jordan Weinstein, absolutely no idea he was Jewish. I mean, it didn't occur to me. Um, that was, it was sort of the environment. And, and I was a Mormon, but people, you know, it was, it was a label. Um, people knew that it meant that I lived a little bit differently, um, but it was relatively, uh, relatively pluralistic. So I, I never felt uh, particularly uh, persecuted uh, as, a, as a Mormon growing up in California. Um, and I'd say that went through high school as well. Um, it, did not, uh, it did not disadvantage me at all. I think if anything, um, I think if anything, it, to, in me and in my life, it was a great advantage uh, to, to have uh, a, a belief structure um, and, and uh, constraints that were built on moral lines as opposed to just rules. Um, that, I, that I was internally driven to keep my life in order as opposed to uh, just being told to do something and questioning it. So, so to, me it was, <coughs> to me it was something of an advantage. I'd say that, uh, that my first year in college uh, was somewhat similar to high school experience. Um, that uh, the, the distinctions that were there were still there, um, did not feel impeded by it. Um, but then at age, uh, age 19 I had to um, make a decision. And you've probably, you probably know what that decision was. Uh, whether or not to, um, uh, to become a full-time missionary uh, for our church. Um, the uh, uh, young folks in our church are highly encouraged uh, to serve as missionaries. It seemed like the natural thing to do. I didn't really uh, question it. It seemed, like a, it seemed like the right thing to do for me. I, you know, I had uh, you know, strong convictions um, about the church and, and how valuable it had been in my life. Um, and I thought it would be worthwhile to, uh, to spend some time doing it. So I, so I applied um, and uh, was, was asked to serve a mission in Taiwan, um, which was actually not too much of a surprise for me because during high school I had started studying Chinese. Um, and so I, had, I could actually speak Chinese okay by the time I, was, I went to Taiwan. Um, served a mission in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, and <clears throat> you've, you've probably seen missionaries about, right? <laughs> Riding bikes or walking the street, um, maybe on the street you see them and you walk across the other side of the street if you don't want to have a conversation, um, but they're not, uh, they're very benign and very, and they will be respectful of your time if you want to say hi, I don't think it's going to hurt you. The, the experience for me was, uh, uh, was very positive. Um, I thought it was, uh, it, it was very enlightening to, to put aside um, all of the you know, concerns about you know, making money or getting educated or whatever and just purely focus on um, human relations, communicating with people, um, uh, helping people to understand God um, and, uh, and, and working uh, in, in, a, in a human service oriented fashion full time. Um, it, uh, it, it, to, to have that experience, you know, I thought, you know, in going into it that I was going to be serving other people, um, but what, uh, when I came out of it, I really recognized that, uh, that, that it was me that, that had been most blessed uh, by that experience uh, in, the, in the personal growth that, uh, that it afforded me uh, and, the, um, uh, and, the, and the, you know, the reflective perspective that it uh, that allowed me. If you look at the influence of, of my religion on my marriage, I think that, uh, I think that, um, that's probably where the most profound effect is. Um, as you've probably read or, or, or perhaps heard, um, the Mormon faith cr creates a, a huge emphasis around family, uh, and particularly around marriage uh, and, the, uh, and the sanctity of marriage, um, as, as evidenced by our, our theology uh, that, uh, that, that marriage is something that's not just for this life, uh, but can continue uh, into the afterlife, um, by our... Um, our absolute uh, insistence upon uh, fidelity, um, uh, both uh, well during marriage and actually before marriage, uh, that uh, that we're abstinent uh, from uh, sexual interactions or intercourse prior to marriage as a um, as a loyalty to one's spouse uh, in the future, um, and and also by our our emphasis on making sure that uh, that children are uh, are getting the attention that they need um, as they grow up. So family is very important to me and has, and has become uh, the, the center of my life. Um, and that's uh, largely, I believe, uh, from the influence of, of, the, uh, of the church and the teachings of the church.
I wanted to talk a little bit about um, about my role in the church. Uh, Tom Tom mentioned that uh, that I'm a bishop, um, and you, know, you think bishop, you probably imagine the tall hat <laughs> and smoke coming out of a. No, that's the cardinals. I'm sorry. Um, so a, a bishop in our church looks um, something like me. Um, we're all everybody who serves in our church uh, is. Uh, or everybody in our church is expected to serve in some capacity. Um, there's, there, um, at, at this, it, when you get to this, to the central organization of the church in Salt Lake City, there are some people who are, who are full time, uh, permanently in roles. Um, but at the, at the, at the popular level, um, we all contribute uh, to the, uh, to the running of the church. I think that, uh, that part of the part of the reason that we love Hanover so much also has to do with our faith. Um, our, uh, you know, our experiences here in the in the ward have been very positive. Uh, we love the fact that the church um, brings us in contact with all kinds of people. Um, that uh, you know, when I go to work, you know, at Hitchcock, and I'm working, you know, mostly with uh, with my colleagues, they're kind of like me, a little bit overeducated, um, you know, spend a lot of time uh, professionally, um, and it's not, uh, <clears throat> but it, it, it's in the church where I really uh, interact on a, in a strong personal way with lots of different people from lots of different castes and lots of different backgrounds. Um, and so that's, uh, that's been particularly valuable. Um, my wife and I also uh, feel um, very positive about living in uh, a place that doesn't have a lot of Mormons. Um, because I, cause as we raise our kids, it's important to us that our children um, learn the um, uh, our values and our beliefs for, for what they are uh, without having a lot of cultural pressure around. Um, I think if, you're, if you raise your kids uh, in, in Utah, um, it's, it may be a little difficult for them to sort out what's, what's cultural and what's religious. Um, and I, and uh, so it's been valuable for us that our children um, have had a chance to, to look at who they are uh, in terms of what they believe uh, and, the, and the standards and morals which they want to pursue as opposed to simply um, this is what everybody does because we're all members of this church. So the, the church has a, a welfare system uh, that, is, uh, that is built on the contributions of uh, members. Um, and the way that the contributions work uh, is somewhat unique. Uh, rather than passing around a plate, uh, what we do is we have a tradition of on the first uh, Sunday of every month, we fast uh, for 24 hours from Saturday night till, till Saturday evening. And then we take the money that we would have spent on food um, and we give it uh, to the church, actually uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the local church to be kept as a, as a welfare uh, fund. Um, and not everybody gives just that amount. Uh, there are a lot of people who, give, who are able to and give far more uh, to be able to help the poor. Um, and my responsibility is the, as the bishop is to uh, seek out the poor uh, in our congregation, um, the ones who have needs, and, uh, and, and help them out. Now, this, um, <clears throat> there are certain guidelines to the way we help people out. Um, we, we don't you know, believe that, uh, that, that people should become you know, wards of the ward, so to speak, <laughs> that, they, that we're not in the business of sustaining people over time, we're in the business of helping people get on their feet and be self-sufficient. Um, and so every time that we do disperse something, it's in the context of some plan. Um, to this is what we're, these are the steps you're going to do so that you no longer require other people's support. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's the way that, that we administer. So that's, that falls to me. That's my responsibility uh, to, uh, to govern that program, uh, to bring people, you know, find people who need help or people just uh, come to me we sit down say what is it that you need how can you get from A to B where B is self-sufficient um, and come up with a plan draw upon um, the the resources of the ward um, uh, many times so for example people have a very complex financial situation that they're stuck and they're in debt and they can't get out um, there's somebody in our ward who is a, a CPA um, who understands finances and I say well can you meet with so-and-so and figure out how to get out of this mess? Or somebody's having trouble with housing. Uh, I have somebody in the ward who's designated the ward housing specialist. And they keep track of sort of 
the real estate markets, um, uh, subsidized housing, you know, all of the, all the complex things around housing. And I can say, could you meet with so-and-so and help them figure out their housing? So we d I draw on the resources of the ward um, and, then, and, and, uh, and carry out the welfare program in consistent with these principles of, of uh, promoting self-sufficiency. Another responsibility that I have uh, is um, helping people who have gone off track um, and have uh, committed serious sin. Um, they will come to me and talk to me, and I help them uh, through the repentance process um, to, uh, to overcome their problem, whether it be, um, you know, adultery or, you know, some other infraction uh, working with them. A lot of times, uh, couples that have um, serious problems will come and talk to me and seek, uh, you know, my advice, and I'll work with them. Uh, we have uh, a family services organization within the church as well uh, that has uh, their social workers uh, in the region. Uh, who are members of the church who will often work with people in the church. Um, and it's helpful when they have that perspective of, uh, of Mormon uh, community and Mormon belief uh, in helping people uh, work through their marriage problems. So there's a, so there's a lot of, of, uh, of social support, both monetary and, and spiritual, uh, and in terms of uh, social services that the church uh, provides as well. And as the bishop, I'm, I'm responsible for uh, coordinating uh, that together as well. So... Um, I was asked to be the bishop, or as we, as we say in the church, called to be the bishop, um, about five years ago, um, well, five years in November. And we typically uh, hold these callings for about five years, so I expect that my term will end soon. Um, there, it isn't a specified term, it's just when somebody else gets called uh, by uh, the regional leadership uh, in Concord. Um, <clears throat> so any, any day now, I will no longer be the bishop. I won't have these responsibilities. Somebody else will have these responsibilities. And I'll get some other responsibility. You know, it could be, you know, taking care of the two-year-olds during Sunday school time. You know, it could be anything um, in the church. Um, I certainly, it was my perspective of the bishop, when I'm constantly asking people to do stuff, I realize how wonderful it is when somebody says, yes, I'll help. <laughs> so, and so I'm just, I'm, I will be happy to say, yes, I'll help to somebody who is asking me to do something. I don't think any of the, of, the, of the callings or the jobs in the church are particularly onerous. Um, so there's, there's nothing that I wouldn't be willing to do. And then finally, um, you know, we believe that, that these callings aren't um, just administered by people. We believe that these, are, these conclusions of who should do what are reached prayerfully, and that there's some level of inspiration. Um, and we ex I expect that when I'm called to do something, the Lord has some uh, design in mind uh, for, for me to be doing it. The hard things are, you know, we have a, um, we have a, what we call a seminary for uh, high school age kids, um, where the kids get together and study the scriptures um, at 6 a.m. Um, and the kids are pretty good about it, but, you know, going to somebody and asking them, will you teach kids the scriptures at 6 a.m. every day, <laughs> voluntarily? Um, and uh, it's remarkable. There are people who love to do that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the people who would have asked have been those people who have been happy to, to do that. And they always come out of it saying, wow, that was a great experience. I'd like to address the, the, the arts question about theology, but it's a little difficult to know exactly where to start. Um, <clears throat> Because it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty expand expansive topic, but I would say, I would say that, um, that, the, that the, critical, um, the critical doctrine uh, is the doctrine of the atonement, um, and that is that, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, um, that uh, uh, the literal Son of God, and that he um, atoned for our sins, um, and through repentance uh, we can be cleansed of our sins and return to Heavenly Father, um, and that uh, that that uh, he was, in fact, resurrected, um, and, uh, uh, and that he is uh, corporeal. And that's, that's an area where we may differ from most religions, is that we believe in a corporeal God, um, that, uh, that he was resurrected and he kept that body, um, and he's, uh, he's a, he's a, uh, you know, he has flesh. Um, we, um, we believe that, uh, that, um, that Jesus Christ and God the Father are uh, separate, individuals, um, but uh, with oneness of purpose. Um, and, uh, and so that um, everything that the, that the Father and the Son do is basically the same, because Jesus Christ is in, in complete conformity with the Father's will. Um, 
we believe that the that the Holy Ghost is a third personage um, that uh, that is uh, not corporeal um, but uh, but spirit um, and as such uh, is able to communicate uh, directly with our own spirits um, th to give us inspiration and guidance. The the other thing that um, that, uh, that we believe, which is uh, somewhat uh, divergent, is that uh, as children of God, um, that we're um, heirs of His. Um, that, in other words, we're children of God, we grow up, we become like God. Not during this lifetime, but that this life is a, a stage um, in, in an eternal progression. Um, that we existed uh, as individuals with identities prior to our birth, um, and that our identities um, will continue after our death, um, that we will be resurrected uh, and continue uh, subsequent to that. Um, and that eventually, maybe several eons from now, have the potential to become like God. So revelation we would, um, we would define as uh, is knowledge imparted on people by God. Um, and, and revelation is something that, uh, that we believe um, anybody can have. Um, and whether you call it uh, inspiration or revelation, I think that there's a, it's a hard to, to draw the line between one or the other. Um, but um, but the, the special role of revelation in our church uh, is that we believe that, that people who are um, uh, leaders of the church, like the, the prophet, uh, the 12 apostles that, uh, that lead the church, we believe that they have the authority to receive revelation for the church or for the world um, because that's their stewardship. Um, but the individuals have every right to receive revelation or inspiration for their own stewardship. Um, so for their own life, uh, for their family, um, or if, you know, if I'm the bishop, um, for my congregation. Um, but uh, but it's, all, it's all a matter of degree. But that re we, we, you know, we believe in revelation, in continuing ongoing revelation, you know, with a capital R and with a small r, that, that God does communicate with people um, sometimes very overtly in big ways, like to the prophet, to Joseph Smith, um, sometimes in very small ways, just by inspiring you with an idea that helps your life. This is a difficult question. Okay. <laughs> if we have somebody in a courtroom who's been accused of a crime, and he or she says, God told me to do this, mm -hmm. we usually put that statement as evidence of some sort of mental derangement. I need your help to get between the two. Yeah. Okay, so um, if uh, I think it's a matter of I think it's a matter of context. You know, if uh, if it doesn't jibe with your idea of God, if the, what the person says was to do something that was heinous, Evil. right? Um, and so that's, that's where that makes it insane. Why would, why would God, who we have this conception of as being perfect and good, tell you to do something nuts? You must be crazy. So that's, that's the context. But if you, yourself, have some inspired idea, then you get the sense that it's coming externally, um, that, that you've been inspired to do something that's actually good in your family. And you told your neighbor, you know, I had this, this sudden epiphany, this thought that I, that I believe came from God, to be somewhere at a certain time or to interact with somebody in a certain way that was immensely helpful. And your neighbor, the last thing your neighbor would say was that you're nuts. You know, they would say, oh, that's wonderful. Our church doctrine is, that, is that, that anything that persuades people to do good is of God. And anything that persuades people not to do good is, is not from God and from, or from the devil. Um, and so, you know, God is the author of all good and is behind all good, is the force for good. Um, if people are saying that God's telling them to do things that are, that are evil, you've got to question whether that's really coming from God. A mother, mm -hmm. as well as a Godfather, yep. and creating spiritual children, mm -hmm. sounds very polytheistic. That's really what mm -hmm. I'm stuck on. If you can right. explain that, I yeah. appreciate it. <clears throat> so the, the polytheism, I think, is a... Um, again, you have to understand that w within context. For this world, um, we believe in God the Father and the Son, and those are the uh, those, that's our those are our gods. So maybe polytheistic, maybe not. Since they're so perfectly one in purpose and action, we're basically worshiping one God. Um, as to whether there could be other worlds with other gods, um, we're open to that. 
we're open to that. Um, but for this world, we're monotheistic. For the, for the universe, yeah, I think you could safely say that we're polytheistic, but we'd only believe that we have one God. About the institutional aspects of the church, particularly the president and the prophet, uh, is that akin to the Pope being infallible in a way? Uh, that the uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Munson, I think he's the current uh, mm -hmm. uh, leader of the LDS yeah. Church. Mm -hmm. He is also the prophet. Mm -hmm. is, is his word inviolate in, in that sense? And, and how is he selected? It's not exactly the same. The whole infallibility thing. You know, we believe that uh, that the prophet uh, is a you know is a man. He's a he's a human. He's got uh, he's he's not perfect. Um, and he can make mistakes. Um, and that Joseph Smith could make mistakes. Brigham Young could make mistakes. And they did make mistakes. No question about it. Um, our, you know, our line, and this is sort of a, uh, maybe it's a, a tautology, but we say that if somebody is, um, is, is speaking by the power of God, they're right. Um, and then it's sort of up to us to figure out whether they're speaking uh, by the word of God. They, and there, but there are clues. Now, if there's unanimity among the quorum of the 12 apostles, now we can be pretty confident that uh, that he's right on. If there's not, um, then then you can be pretty sure that, that whoever's speaking is is uh, um, is speaking of their own mind uh, from an imperfect perspective. In terms of the in terms of the leadership and, and how they're chosen, um, our our model for the church is the same as as existed for. Um, the twelve apostles after Jesus Christ was crucified, um, and that is they were missing one. You know, Judas sort of stepped out, um, and uh, and they got together um, and uh, and chose somebody to replace him. Um, similarly, um, the uh, when somebody when you when somebody is called to be a member of the quorum of the twelve apostles, um, they're that for life. Uh, and, uh, and when somebody dies from that group, um, the, the, uh, the Twelve Apostles uh, get together um, and, uh, and choose the replacement, um, presumably uh, inspired through Revelation. And by, by tradition, the senior most member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles has become uh, the, the prophet upon the prophet's death. Uh, and, um, I, you know, it's not, it's not written anywhere that it has to be that way. Um, but that's the that's the that's the way it's always been. Most of what uh, you know sermons they give are, you know, they're not necessarily you know doctrine heavy. They're mostly about you know testifying of Jesus Christ and his importance, need to repent, uh, you know, the need to get our lives in order, uh, to be kind to each other, to stop fighting, you know, all the things that 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 you know Jesus Christ himself was trying to teach people to do. So that's mostly what they're talking about, um, you know. They, you know, they may have to address some doctrinal issue once in a while, but not that much. You know, most of that's been, it's mostly, it's mostly reinforcement. They're advocates. Um, they're, they're witnesses of Christ. I mean, that's, that's their main job. Um, now, um, you know, occasionally they will, there will be a, you know, some um, notice or letter that's sent out to everybody in the church. And, and as the bishop, I receive those, and I will, you know, read it from the pulpit. Um, and they're, <clears throat> but they're, there are things like, um, seems like just about every election year, they issue a statement that I'm to read to the pulpit, which basically says, um, go out and vote. Um, good ideas and good people can come from any party. Um, vote your conscience, and that's it. Um, but encouraging people to take part in the, in the process. Um, the, and then, so another example, you know, there's <clears throat> some concerns about preparedness. Um, you know, that we got a notice a, a couple of years saying, you know, don't forget uh, to be prepared for catastrophe. Um, that, you know, get a food supply, you know, have some savings, get as much education as you can, you know, particularly to the youth. Um, and, uh, you know, and, those were, and that was timed, you know, shortly before the big economic downturn. Um, so, you know, we consider that to have been you know, foresight, you know, divinely guided foresight that we needed to be prepared uh, for, for, for a tough time. Having to do with the baptism of Jews, yes. uh, instructing people to stop doing it, Yeah. Okay. essentially. Can you talk about sure. the notion of baptizing people who are dead? Sure. In, uh, in our church, we, um, 
you know, we, we adhere to the, the, the doctrine that Jesus Christ taught that no one enters the kingdom of heaven without being baptized. Um, and to us, baptism uh, represents a commitment, you know, it's a ritual that represents a commitment to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and we, you know, we believe that, uh, that everybody um, should have the opportunity to be baptized. Um, now, obviously, not everybody in the world does, and particularly, you know, the you know, millions of people who have died before us. And so what we do is, uh, is uh, you know, one of the doctrines of church is that we can do proxy baptisms. In other words, you stand in for your ancestor and be baptized um, physically uh, in the water. Uh, and, uh, and then that person on the other side has an opportunity to accept it or not. Um, Okay, so it's, it's not like it, they're forced into anything. It's the same as with anything. There's always agency. So they can choose to accept it or not. Now, um, now the doctrine, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting doctrine. Um, my perspective is that, that a lot of that doctrine is not about the dead, but it's about us. Um, you know, the people who do that are expressing um, uh, respect and reverence for those who have gone before. You know, it's an act of service for people they don't see. It, uh, it makes us cognizant of the long chain of, uh, of our families and the fact that we're all one big family. So I think that it has, it has positive spiritual effects on those who participate in that, um, even you know, here and now, as a, and, and you know, to say nothing of what you know, might be happening on the other side. Now, that particular uh, letter came out because there were some people who became a little too aggressive about finding people to baptize and were, were you know, submitting names uh, to, to have people baptized who were not their ancestors. Uh, and, uh, and, and there were some people who took offense uh, when their ancestors, you know, because they didn't understand the doctrine that it wasn't really binding, that this was something that, that people on the other side could accept or not. Um, I, you know, to me, it doesn't seem particularly offensive you know, if somebody wanted to baptize my ancestors in a church that I didn't believe in, you know, I'd figure my, my ancestors were no worse for it. But that, you know, that's my perspective. Other people's perspective, they think that that's, a, that's disrespectful for their ancestors. And so the church, in respect for that, said, um, this is, you know, you should be only baptizing by proxy people who are your own ancestors um, and not just go find people um, who are other people's ancestors. Twice a year, there's a general conference. None of the none of the wards around the world meet. Um, they all, um, you know, to to have their own services. Instead, we all tune into the, what's being broadcast from Salt Lake City. Um, so, you know, if you ever find a Mormon church, look around the back. There's almost always a satellite disc out back. Um, it's so that those conferences can be broadcast. But now, I mean, most people just watch it on the internet because um, you can see it anywhere. In your five year, uh, in your five years of mm -hmm being a bishop and receiving the instructions from the general authorities. Has there ever been a specific um, directive that says um, that we don't support gay, members of the church don't say support gay marriage? Um? I haven't received any uh, official directives on the issue, um, even all the way through, you know, when it was, uh, you know, an, uh, an, an active issue in New Hampshire. Um, in California, I think it was a little bit of an, ex an, uh, an exception. It may have been a mistake. Um, the, you know, my, you know, my, I'm, I'm glad that it hasn't come up for me uh, because, um, you know, my perspective is a little different on, uh, on, on gay marriage. Um, but no, it hasn't, it hasn't come up as an official thing. Is it still so that the uh, Mormons are supposed to have close to a year's supply of food? I think the proportion to actually have a whole year is not that high, um, but uh, but that's the I mean that's the goal, and so mo I think most people have some supply, whether they actually will get to a whole year. Why? Um, why? Yeah. Um, to uh, to be prepared for um, for tough times, storms, economic times. I think that the whole year is not that we're suddenly going to have nothing for a year, but you know whenever things go really bad, like so uh, you know the the hurricane and and in the south, in Louisiana, there were a lot of Mormons there who had a lot of food in their basements and water um, that helped a lot of people. You know, so it's not just that we're going to take care of ourselves, but we want to be in a position where we can help other people too when things get bad.
and it's not it's not uncommon, you know that uh, you know that somebody in the church who has a supply will have you know, will know somebody who's really poor, doesn't have any food, and they'll say, hey, come on down to my basement, you know, take what you need, um, and that way people are in a, they're in a position to help people without actually um, disadvantaging themselves. Temple. Yeah. Sorry. Temple. Right. So, um, you know, the, the vast majority of our buildings, vast majority, are meeting houses, um, like what we have in, um, in locally over on Route 4. Um, there are, there for specific regions, there will be a temple. The closest one to us is in Boston. Before that one was built, the closest one is, was in D.C. Um, there, so there aren't as many of those. I think, you know, the entire world, there's probably a hundred or so, maybe a little more. Um, when I was growing up, there were like 12. Um, now, the temple is, some, is a place that, uh, that, is, that is different from a meeting house in that it's, uh, it's considered um, more sacred um, and that, uh, that even within the church, um, it, people have to meet um, certain standards of, of, uh, of living uh, worthily, you know, that they're that they're, you know, uh, that they have faith, um, that they're living chaste lives, that they're being honest, um, that they're uh, paying tithing, making contributions to the church, um, that they're um, honoring their families, um, uh, supporting the church. I mean, and there's, there's like a series of questions that, uh, that ecclesiastical authorities will ask of somebody in order to be allowed to go into the temple. Um, and that's simply because we consider that a, you know, a, a very sacred place, and we don't want just anybody going. People going in there have to be, um, uh, you know, of a, of a certain uh, level of, uh, of commitment. That's, that's where the proxy baptisms are done. I mean, that's where, <coughs> that's where the, the, uh, the marriages are done uh, that, uh, that are for, you know, eternal marriages, the ones that we consider uh, being ones that last beyond the grave. Divorce is very, is, is discouraged. Um, but it's recognized that at some point it's, it's, it's needed. Um, and, <clears throat> um, you know, I think that, uh, I think, you know, there are, there are a number of divorced people, so for example, in our congregation, um, you know, and they're, they're afforded this, the same, you know, privileges and opportunities that anybody else in the, in the ward is offered. Genealogy records, how did that all get started? The interest in genealogy, um, is a, is a very, has a very positive spiritual effect on those who participate in it. Because you don't have to go back very far, you know, to discover that you're actually related to a lot of people. Um, and not just people of your own race. I mean, most of us have blood of other races. And it, it connects us more. We recognize that, hey, we are one human family. Um, so I, I think that's one of the, the, the main effects of it. You know, why we're doing it, um, you know, we would trace it back to a revelation. You know that the Lord said to one of the prophets, um, "Learn about your ancestry um, for the proxy work, um, but I think also uh, to inculcate in us a sense of continuity from generation to generation, and our not only our past generation, but a sense of responsibility for generations. That you know gives us perspective that, that we need to, uh, you know, for example, take care of the earth um, because we've got generations that are going." The, the, mm, the First of all, with res I think there's two questions there. One is, you know, what's our stance with respect to other churches? Um, as I said before, you know, our doctrine is that anything that persuades somebody to do good is of God. Um, the, um, the, there's also explicit doctrine about not contending against other churches. That we don't, that, 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 you know, we shouldn't be contending against other churches, particularly the ones that are trying to help people to do good things. Um, now, in terms of, of their souls, um, I think that uh, I think this is one of the this is sort of the good news about Mormonism is that we think that, that everybody has a chance um, that uh, that they have a, everybody has when I say everybody has a chance they have a, a chance to accept Christ um, to repent to change to follow Jesus Christ um, and that uh, and that that's afforded to people either in this life. Uh, or in the life to come, that there's, a, that there's continuity between this life and, and the future. And, that, and, and the proxy baptism idea sort of reinforces that idea that this isn't the end of the story, um, that there are opportunities uh, to, to, uh, to accept Jesus Christ. We believe that, that eventually everyone will know him, everyone uh, will confess that he is God's son, I mean, everyone will have an opportunity to accept or not accept him, either in this life or in, or in the future. And that, and that somebody's 
the, the destiny of someone's soul is intimately connected to that decision once they know what they do about it. We, you know, we believe that the, that, the, that the baptism that's offered in the church is the, is the baptism that's authorized by God, um, and therefore it has to be that baptism. But, um, you know, this, you know, the Mormon church's time on earth is very short. The influence that it has right now is severely limited. Um, so why do people think that Mormons are all Republicans? Because of the business interest? And conservatism in general. Mm -hmm. Who is the highest ranking Mormon politician right now? Wrong. Maybe Harry Reid. Harry Reid. Right. He's like fourth in line to the presidency, isn't he? Yeah, Harry Reid, a Democrat. So uh, there again, the, the, the stereotypes don't always fit. Now, most of Utah is very heavily Republican. Uh, but if you look at the, the, the political map over the last 20 years of, of voting, it's right smack in the middle of this mass of redness. Um, so Utah, just like Montana, just like you know, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all the surrounding states, that's a Republican area. So a lot of the, the Utah Mormons uh, are, are Republicans. Um, and there's probably the majority of LDS people are Republicans for a variety of reasons. Um, but not, uh, but that's, it's a little bit of a stereotype as well. I mean, it's, it's striking to me that the, that the highest ranking politician uh, in, the, in the church right now is actually a Democrat. Now Mitt Romney, um, he may or may not, probably not, uh, become the highest ranking politician in their church. Uh, but uh, we'll, the time will tell. Mm -hmm.